So I have a friend who, after living through this pandemic, has decided to walk the Appalachian Trail. She recently posted a quote that she came across in the Spring Mountain Shelter logbook on Instagram. It said, choose a goal so great you will never achieve it until you become the person who can. I had this idea in mind when I sat down today to rewrite this old and, by my current standards, pretty terrible script about the Florence Cathedral. See, during the summers, I go back to some of my old videos and I remake them with better production value and better storytelling. Usually it's pretty easy, but this old video about Florence Cathedral, it was basically just bullet points of information. It was bad. There's no story, no interesting analysis, and no narrative. So I had a lot of work to do to make the video that you see today. And I want to reframe the history of that building. This is the story of a city that set a goal for itself so ambitious that it had to transform itself in order to accomplish that goal. This is the story of the Florence Cathedral. So this is the Santa Maria dei Fiori, or the Florence Cathedral, or as it's often referred to, Il Duomo. It's one of the most recognizable buildings in the world, but it's also one of those buildings that will simply take your actual breath away if you see it in person. I've been to Florence with people who don't care that much for art or architecture and who have been stopped mid-stride at the first sight of this building. For those of us who do have a bit of interest in this stuff, they know that this building is a symbol for the Renaissance. It's like the architectural equivalent of the Statue of David or the birth of Venus but it predates both of those examples. Florence had to become a center for artists before those other things could happen here. This building had to happen first. So let's tell its story. In the mid 1200s, the church at this site was old and crumbling and was inadequate for the growing city of Florence. The city council approved a new design for a new church by Arnolfo di Cambrio, the same architect who did Santa Croce and the Palazzo Vecchio. He laid out the initial plans for this building in 1297, and his model included a huge dome, like impossibly large dome. His model looked like it would work, but shortly after Di Cambrio's death, that dome inside his model collapsed under its own weight. So clearly it would be bad if they built this at a large scale and something like that happened. Even with that knowledge, construction continued. The goal had been set. The artist Giotto took over construction for a bit. He didn't make an honest attempt at putting together that dome, but he did get everybody really hyped up for it by completing the bell tower or the campanile. And they made it as tall as the cathedral would eventually be. Like by looking at this bell tower, you could see the height of the eventual dome and get excited about it. You could see the potential but it was really unclear how that potential could be realized. An actual plan for how a dome that large could be built remained elusive. In fairness to the 14th century engineers and architects in Florence, they had to compete with plenty of obstacles, including the Black Death in 1348. So in 1366, a contest was held to design a safer dome than Di Cabrio's, and two competing plans were presented. One by Giovanni di Lapogini, who proposed external buttressing to support the dome, similar to the way that Gothic cathedrals support their large vaulted ceilings. Just put some funny legs on the side and those would counter the outward force of the dome. The issue, you see, with a dome is that the weight of it pushes down and out. Buttresses could fix that. That's a problem, though. Buttresses were part of France, Germany, or Milan's architectural traditions, and these places were the historic enemies of Florence. If Florence was going to self-actualize, it couldn't take from the architectural vocabulary of other cities. It had to be original. Florence needed a distinct visual identity. Looking back on this, it's kind of amazing how successful they actually were. But to return to the contest of 1366, the second plan came from an architect named Neri di Fioravanti, who proposed a double dome structure that could support itself with large sandstone chains incorporated into the domes themselves. These chains were intended to sort of hug the dome from the inside and preventing that outward force from pushing too hard on the supporting walls below. So the idea was that these chains, if you paired them with the octagonal shape of the dome rather than the full round shape like the Pantheon in Rome, it could have integrity. 
and without those messy buttressing at that. Obviously, you can tell by the way that I'm telling the story that Mary's idea won this contest, and his model with the internal sandstone hugging rings stood inside the unfinished cathedral. The design was set, but the execution part, well, that was considered the greatest engineering problem of its time and place. The model just sat there, challenging potential architects and engineers to make it a reality. Florence still had some transformation to go before it became the city it needed to be. So more than a century after its initial planning, and just over half a century after Neri constructed his model, 1418, this massive cathedral still had no dome, no roof. If it rained, it rained inside. If I were better with photo editing, I'd show you what that looks like, maybe in five years from now. But for now, let's just use our imaginations. This building, no dome. So the wealthy Woolmakers Guild who oversaw the construction held another contest. Florence, in the 15th century, was big on these design contests. And, you know, that's a big part of this transformation. Florence had a bit of money to throw around at this problem through its textile trade and the rise of the florin as the dominant international currency. So they used that money to attract talent with these contests. You get enough engineers and artists in a place at the same time and something cool is gonna get built. Like, for example, in 1401, they held a similar contest to design the doors of their old baptistry. And two rising stars of the Florentine art world, Lorenzo Ghiberti and Filippo Brunelleschi, both designed brilliant panels. Ghiberti won that contest, and the doors are spectacular. Not only are they beautiful, but Ghiberti figured out new forging techniques in the process. Florence was becoming a place of good design and innovative technology. So that contest was a huge success. Why not apply that same logic to the problem of the dome? And this contest came down to two established stars of the Florentine art world, Lorenzo Ghiberti and Filippo Brunelleschi. This time, Brunelleschi, bitter from his previous loss to Ghiberti, went to the judges and challenged them to stand an egg upon its head. When they failed, he pulled this move. Obviously, the judges protested that this was a simple solution. It was like cheating. Brunelleschi countered that if he revealed his plan to finish the dome, they would find it similarly easy. Somehow, that was good enough for him to win this contest against his rival. Now, this story was told by Giorgio Vasari in his famous The Lives of Artists, written about a century and a half later. So let's not take it too seriously, but also let's admit that if it's true, what confidence Brunelleschi had. The story is also telling of Brunelleschi's personality. He liked to work alone and was very protective of his ideas. The argument could be made that one of his ideas, the design for a boat that transported marble, was awarded the first patent in European history. So being protective of intellectual property is kind of his thing, or at least one of his things. Engineering is probably his primary thing. He still needed to use Nary's model for the internal rings, and this required him to invent a clasping system that would hold the sandstone beams together, creating that chain. Brunelleschi had a number of these ad hoc inventions that became widely used outside of architecture. Like he invented a gear shift for lifting the heavy materials up to the height of the dome, for example. The guy was an ideas machine. Not only did he build this dome, he built it without any buttressing or internal scaffolding. Like, I don't just mean the final design. I mean, he didn't have scaffolding holding up the dome as it was being built. He found a way to build it such that the dome came together without the support from the ground. But I'm skipping to the end. Let's go back to the process and enjoy that process. There's that problem of outward force that I talked about earlier with the buttressing. The internal dome is much thicker than the outer dome. It goes from seven feet wide at the base to just over two feet wide near the peak. The internal chain from Nary's design works there, but the outer dome is too thick for that trick. Consequently, it needs to be supported by other ingenious tactics nobody had ever seen before. So Brunelleschi inserted 144 horizontal arches to support the external dome by attaching them to the large sandstones that defined the octagon. He also used a very specific herringbone brick pattern that supported itself as it was constructed. If he had used a standard horizontal brick pattern, 
the bricks would slip off the dome as he ascended, but this herringbone brick pattern allows for vertical bricks to lock the horizontal bricks in place. Overall, there's more than 4 million bricks in this dome, and as all of Brunelleschi's biographers will tell you, he inspected every single one. When completed, the dome had a 143-foot diameter and rose 375 feet. To this day, close to 600 years later, it remains the largest brick and dome mortar in the world, and it was built without centering. In 1439, the Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church were planning a summit in the Italian city of Ferrara. Due to an outbreak of the plague, the council responsible for planning needed a new location, and the city of Florence agreed to finance the move. At this summit, Byzantine diplomats and scholars, the heirs to the Roman Empire and the Greek intellectual tradition, were brought to the city of Florence and came face to face with this building, a dome bigger than that of the Hagia Sophia. So by the time of the so-called Council of Florence, it was clear that Florence had become the city that it wanted to be. It created its own aesthetic. It proved itself a worthy heir to that Roman and Greek tradition, and many of those Byzantine academics chose to stay in Florence, or they returned to Florence after the Byzantine Empire fell just a few years later. It has since served as the inspiration for Michelangelo's dome at St. Peter's, which I have a video about, and it inspired Christopher Wren's dome at St. Paul's, which I also have a video about. And by making those previous videos, I got better, and I'm slowly becoming the video essayist that I aspire to be. So subscribe, because maybe in another five years, I'll be embarrassed by the quality of this one, and I'll try it again.